want to start um, by talking about somebody who I bet you and Rachel know personally, and that is, well, ask the group a question. Who's the highest paid actress in Hollywood? Oh, maybe I'm wrong. Okay, I think I think it's Emma Stone. Um, Emma Stone won the Academy Award for La La Land this year. She's, I think, 28 years old. She made $26 million. By the way, I had my EA look up who is the highest paid man in Hollywood. It's Mark Wahlberg. He makes three times that. We'll take that up in another panel. But I bring up Emma Stone because Emma Stone was actually here last Tuesday and she attended an event, I'll get the name wrong, but it's something like the Billie Jean King Leadership Initiative Awards. She was given an award, she was honored, and when she got up to speak, she said, why do I deserve to be here? I often feel like an imposter. So highest paid woman in Hollywood, someone we all know, someone who's tip of the tongue for all of us, and the first thing she has to say is I feel like an imposter. So we are here to talk about a very specific topic, which is imposter syndrome. We're gonna talk about three things related to it. I thought in prepping for this panel, this is a very personal topic, and we are gonna start personal. We're gonna talk about how imposter syndrome has affected each one of you here on the panel. We're gonna talk about the root causes, and we're gonna talk about what we as women, what we as executives, what we as people who work at companies can do to help women as they feel it and as they're coming through their careers. So let me just take a quick moment to introduce this amazing panel. We all know Shelly. What I wanna say about Shelly is, in addition to everything she's done for women, and I'm gonna say to everybody, we'll do the whole panel and then you can applaud if you want to, but in addition to creating this incredible space for us, Shelly in her own right, I found myself saying this to Amanda as we were walking here, is a badass entrepreneur who created a lot of jobs and economic value and real value in the world. We don't say that about you enough. Dylan, the amazing, Dylan, the incredible, amazing founder of Makers, and yes, with, with a new hairdo that we all love. Um, I need a lot of love on this one. Um, Emmy-winning television producer, so much, so much good in the world for women, but also not just on that topic in so many other places. The incredible Alicia Hatch, who I think I've now gotten to do this with two or three times. Um, we're going to talk about a lot about Alicia's really interesting background, but she's the CMO today of Deloitte Digital. She's done a tour in the gaming world. She's done a tour as an entrepreneur. And as I understand, spent some time working in the African bush. So we may have to get to that um, <laughs> on another panel. Um, first time um, panelist, at least for me, Julie Larson Green, who's the chief experience officer at Microsoft, 24 years there. And Julie, as I understand, that makes you one of the highest ranking software engineers at Microsoft. So very happy to have you and your perspective. And then my friend, Deborah Bass, I think we've done this a few times now together. Deborah is the president of Marketing Services, tiny little company you've heard of called J&J. &J. So has a lot of impact, touches a lot of consumers every day. It's actually using her pulpit in very interesting ways on this particular topic of gender equality and women and how we feel about ourselves. So you know what? Also, I just want to say none of us would have ever known each other had we not have met in the Absolutely. girls' lounge, and literally, you know, I know it is amazing when we sit here and talk about how we've all met before. I would never have met anybody had it not have been having a home like this to come to. So I find this really, you know, incredible. Right, right on to that. And I was saying actually to somebody, I didn't have to write bios for this one because I know you all. Like you're all a part of my life, which is so great. So I want to I want to actually ask each of you. I'm going to start with Dylan. I want to ask each of you to talk a little bit about this notion of imposter syndrome. And Dylan, I'm I'm starting with you. Talk about it in the context of your own life. What I want to say to you is I saw you for the first time when you received your Matrix Award, which I think was in 2014, and somebody made a parody video of you, and it was basically Dylan going around with a microphone trying to get people to talk to her for makers and people slamming doors in her face. And one of those doors was Tim Armstrong, who ultimately 
paid you ungodly sums of money, I hope, <laughs> to buy your company, so you got him to do it. Um, you, to me, that video literally was my first introduction to you, and I thought, fearless. So I want to know, have you ever actually felt imposter syndrome, or did you just kind of pass through on the way up in your career without feeling it? No, completely fearless. No imposter here. Yeah, uh -uh. Totally. Completely. Oh my gosh. I'm like a Petri dish, dish for this. Um, I, I feel like I have two personalities. You know, there's Dylan, and Dylan is this relentless warrior who did, you know, knock on all these doors, and people said, oh, we don't, you know, people don't care about women's stories. And, you know, is this going to be really feministy? I don't want to do that. And, you know, like all these doors slammed and, um, you know, but, but I like to say that, um, you know, I've never met a no that I didn't want to at least try to turn into a yes. Um, so that's Dylan. And then, um, you know, Shelly knows this. There's a woman named Lisa McCarthy who does this, you know, take the negative voice out of your head, and she has you name her. And so mine's named Molly. Um, and so Molly kind of rears her head in here every once in a while. And I remember, um, I remember just a year ago, um, I was at the Vanity Fair conference feeling like so hoity-toity that I had been invited. And I did this little side meeting, you know, with media executives and, again, like all feeling puffed up. And I sit in the room and I get seated next to a guy I went to high school with. And he has done one big hit, and I'm not going to say what it is, because I'm not going to reveal who he is, but I'm going to dish on him a little bit. But he, um, so he's had this one big HBO hit, and I'm seated next to him, and I'm like, hey, mm, uh, you know, how are you? And he's like looking at me like, oh, I think I might remember. I'm like, of course you know who I am. And then, so the meeting got, starts going, and they're like, you know, well, maybe we could take this to HBO. And he's like, oh, yeah, I'll take it to HBO. And I'm like, wait. I have a relationship with HBO. And they're like, or, or, or he's like, or I'll take it to Netflix, and blah, blah, blah. And I was thinking that, like, <sighs> you know, and I just sat there silent. I did. Molly came out, and I just sat there, and I was letting him do all this work. And then I left, and I was like, damn it, he has one Emmy. I have two. <laughs> and then I was like, he didn't start a brand. I started a brand. And I was so pissed at myself. So, but it's helpful because I literally did. I was like, there's Molly again. So it's like, you know, get rid, get rid of her. All right, so, so there's advice in that, which is name her and then banish her. Yeah, kick her which out. I, name her and banish her. And I realize I'm not sure I defined imposter syndrome for everyone, so let me just take a minute and do it. It's basically the idea that you feel you got to where you are for some reason other than your ability. And to be clear, imposter syndrome... Apparently, it's, it's, a, um, it's not considered a clinical disorder by psychologists, but it is considered a real thing. So it's not in the, whatever they call it, the DSM-3R, but it is a real thing, and it affects men, it affects women much more often than it affects men. So that's, that's Dylan's take. Is it true, Dylan, I have to ask you, that um, you actually got a no from Gloria Steinem and had to, like... Yes, oh, Molly, as I to shut said, up. I, you know, I went to her set and I said, "We are going to do a film on your life for HBO. It's going to be the most amazing thing." And she was like, "No, we're not." Yeah. You know, <laughs> she's and she said to me, "You can't tell the story of the women's movement through the story of one person." Um, and so then we created makers to tell all women's stories, um, and then. That no turned into a yes. Amazing. Love that. Okay. So, Julie, um, I want to talk to you next. I want you to tell us your story. And I want to um, say I read um, you did an interview with Glamour. And in that interview, you said something like, I have spent a lifetime around lots and lots of men, including having to lead them, going back to my babysitting years, when it was like a pack of men I was looking after, and it was kind of like Lord of the Flies. That did not strike me as someone who didn't believe in herself from an early age. So tell us, did you, and by the way, I hope one of you says, no, I didn't, I never felt like an imposter. So do feel free to say that too. I think in the beginning, I, well, that babysitting story, definitely I think about the roots of that uh, several times through the years. So uh, I lived next door to five boys, and I had two sisters. And so the only people to play with in our rural community was the boys next door. So you had to learn how to control the situation and to get them to try to do what you want them to do, otherwise you're going to play, you know, 
gun games the whole time. So, um, <laughs> and so that was you know some early, early years. But mostly during my career, I didn't really think about more than the work, and didn't really think about um, imposter syndrome versus non-imposter syndrome. Uh, most I think most of the time, by focusing on the work, I was able to you know keep moving forward, keep moving forward. As I rose up in the organization, then I started noticing, oh wow. That's not working. I'm not really fitting in. Um, I don't feel supported. What's going on? Maybe I'm not as good as I think I am. Maybe I haven't done all these things. Maybe it's in my head. And so they definitely have gone through those kinds of uh, worries and concerns and actually have come to learn for myself it's based on fear, fear of not knowing enough, not being good enough, not having, uh, having someone know more than me, saying the wrong thing, not showing up right. And so if I can really focus on, you know, well, if I have fears, other people in this room have fears, how can I be vulnerable with my fears? And then other people tend to lean into that. If you can show that you're concerned about something, everyone's concerned about something. Any healthy person has doubts about themselves at some point in time. So, so I love that answer. I also read about you that you said something like, you have to believe that most people are well intended. Mm -hmm. Is that do I have that yeah. that right? So how does that play into what you just said? It's sort of like I feel this way, but so do you. Like right. ha help us understand. It's a, assume good intent. It's always been kind of a mantra of mine. So it's oh, so easy to think about. Well, they probably don't like my shoes, or they're going to judge me in some way. Or and I love your shoes, by thank the way. you. <laughs> And so, you know, just being able to put yourself in someone, have real empathy, put yourself in someone else's place and really think about how you feel. Uh, other people are probably feeling just as insecure, just as, as vulnerable. And so if you show a little bit of that vulnerability, it brings it down for the whole room. And then everyone can kind of join in from a different place and focus on the goal of the meeting or the goal of the thing you're trying to do rather than you know, no one else thinks about you as much as you think about you. So that's something to remind yourself. That That's such a big point, that nobody else is thinking that hard about your performance or how you're behaving or acting. It's actually kind of arrogant to think that everyone's thinking about you in the room. <laughs> I love that. I love that. So, Deborah, um, let's talk about your your experience or not with imposter syndrome. And what I want to say about you is you've worked in very big companies, you've worked in packaged goods, beauty, healthcare, um, and you've led very, very big teams. So how, what's your experience like with this? Have you had it? So I feel that at times people try to afflict it, inflict it on me, I'm and I'll give a very right no, and I'll give no, 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 and I'll give a very pointed example. So I spent six years in orthopedics at Johnson and Johnson, and for anyone in the audience who may have worked in orthopedics or had any kind of orthopedic procedure, the whole industry through and through is men. It's male sales reps and male surgeons and male hospital administrators and men running the business. So I joined orthopedics to build a brand. And I was very fortunate in that I had a leader, Mike Mahoney, I'll call him out by name, he now runs Boston Scientific, who was very inclusive and saw me as a marketer and brand builder and someone that brought complementary skills to the table. And there were meetings I went to, one in particular, I'll tell this story, I went to a meeting with surgeons. We were launching the Attune Knee, which is the hottest new knee for anyone that needs a <laughs> high performance knee. And, and I, I was told by the president of orthopedics, I won't say his name, not to speak in the meeting. Because what could I possibly say that would be enlightening to any surgeon since I didn't grow up in that space? And then during the meeting, Mike is texting me saying, why aren't you talking? <laughs> <laughs> and so my point here is there have been people that have tried to silence me, not thinking that I had something valuable to bring, but then it's all about sponsorship, which is one of my themes. So someone like a Mike that had the courage to be an inclusive leader, to know I brought something different. And then once I started talking, guess what? Surgeons are consumers, right? They relate to everything I said. It created a different energy in the room. So I think people may try to inflict it on us, but then you need to bring yourself out of it and look for other sponsors that, that lift you up behind your own confidence and energy. I love that. And that's, a, that's a, an interesting notion that it's you can actually inflict insecurity on someone or inflict imposter syndrome. So Alicia, you have 
worked in kind of three different industries. You started as a gamer, if I if I understand it, Microsoft. Surrounded Microsoft. by men. Surra Microsoft. Yes, Microsoft. Surrounded, surrounded by surrounded men. Surrounded by men. So I, I got to thinking that in your career, you've made these leaps, like from gaming to being an entrepreneur, entrepreneur very different, and then to a big corporate services organization, very different. There's got to be some feeling as you go from one to the other, I don't know everything. What, you know, like I'm not prepared for this. Is there? So much self-doubt. So much self-doubt all along the way. But you know what was interesting is in the roles that I've had, they've always been roles focused on things that have never been done before. Mm. And the doubt came from the fact that there was no path under my feet. There was no model for what good looked like. There was no person I was trying to become. It was figure it out. And so I was kind of, the fear come, sets in, you know, running at the bull all the time. Who am I to say, what if? What if we did this differently? What if we looked at this from another angle? And along the path, I kind of forgot to focus on the fact that I was a woman and that that mattered or didn't matter or you know, I was definitely surrounded by men, but I was so much more focused on the challenge that I think the doubt came from a different origin than sometimes we prescribe to being women. And, and just like, how, do you, how did you push through it? Like you, you had the yeah. doubt, so how do you get to the other side of the doubt? I mean, the, what the interesting thing was is I ended up and in inadvertently flipping it where actually it was the gray that inspired me. It was the unknown that I started running towards. That was where the opportunity was, and that's why my career accelerated, was because I could go do something in, that had not been done before and actually make a really distinct contribution. So the magic was in the gray. The magic was in the fact that I had so much self-doubt that I, I, and I had no model, figure it out. I was able to actually do more. It became the challenge that was the springboard. So like the fear is a safe space kind of thing and, the, and a place where you can be super productive. And yes, guess what? Every industry is this way now. Yeah, the right. Business climate is so dynamic. Right. We all need to be running at the gray. And I think it's never been a better time to be a woman in business. There's so much opportunity to add distinct value to be embracing that collaborative model of leadership as a woman and to do things that have never been done before in a way that has never been done before. So there's mo way more opportunity to contribute. So I love that and I love and I agree and we'll come to this notion of there's it's never been a better time to be a woman or a business person because everything is changing so much and we can we all should run for the gray. Shelly, I was thinking what I want to know from you is what does what is like a tough day at the office? look like what is how it's it's so hard for all of us any of us to imagine you feeling like an imposter because you've done such good work for each of us to not feel that way so what is it what's a day where Shelly Zalas feels like oh I'm not very good at this is there ever that day I had so many of those days I mean and I I think that a day in the life that was typical for me once upon a time yeah was people just saying no I hate the word no, and everything I did was not good enough, and everything I did was wrong, and you know, I'm 55 turning 56, so I've been in the workplace for a very, very, very long time, and when I started in my career, I, I really was the perfect employee, I thought. You know, I came in early, I stayed late, I asked everyone if I could help them, you know, and not that I knew what I was doing, but, and I kept my lights on really late, even though I was probably shopping. We didn't have, you know, in catalogs, we didn't have online shopping at the time and typing on a typewriter because we didn't have computers even at the time. But I, I thought it was perfect. And I then got called in for my first review and it was terrible. I got ripped to shreds that I spent too much time with clients having lunches and relationships. And I was supposed to be an order taker. And 
and I was supposed to be this and not that, and I was to this and I wasn't that. And and then I remember, you know, I was in business development and, you know, the greatest challenge, and it, it was a, a big client, it was Procter & Gamble. And, you know, I worked in a research company and my company didn't have Procter. They had everyone else, but they didn't have Procter because with normative databases, it takes a long time to convert a client from one copy testing system to another. I said, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go after Procter & Gamble. But all my bosses were men. And I said, I'm going to go after Procter. And I was told that it wasn't the right time. And I thought, well, what, what does that mean? It's not the right time. Like, is God going to tell me today's the day to pick up the phone and call? And so I happened to be on a panel with the head of research from Procter & Gamble. His name was Larry Mock. And my bosses you know, were sitting in the front row. And I'm whispering back and forth with Larry. And I get off the stage. And my bosses said, well, what, what did you talk to him about? I said, I just asked him, when is the right time? I, I said, I'm just curious, when is the right time for ASI to pitch your business? And he said, next week. I said, so we're going into Proctor. I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> and my bosses were like, oh my god, this is crazy, this is crazy. And, and like, Paul is going, and Jim is going, and Jerry is going, and, and Gary is going. And I'm like, what about Shelly? <laughs> and they said, you know, it's a man's world. You know, I, we don't think that's the best team. I said, great, I'll cancel the meeting. And I said, if I don't go, I'm going to cancel the meeting. And I was 26. I had no permission to be a badass. And I had no permission to own my truth. But I also knew that they were wrong. And I actually remembered saying to my boss that ripped me to shreds, I said, you're so wrong. Relationships matter. And, you know, I can't be what you want me to be, an order taker. And if that's what you expect of me, I don't belong here. I had to find my own voice because no one helped me. And I, I always knew I thought differently. But what I realized was I brought that feminine perspective to the workplace that wasn't there. And I had to make my own bed. And then finally, one day, I said to the bosses, it's time to migrate research from offline to online. I think it's a big idea. The problem was no one was online except wealthy old men with broadband, hardly a representative population. And once again, I was told it wasn't the right time. And I got so sick of hearing about it's not the right time, I pulled an Alicia. And I decided I have to follow my own heart. I want to be right. I don't want to always be told I'm wrong. And that's when I left to start my own company with no permission, no right to do it, not a penny in the bank. But I knew that if I didn't do it and I didn't follow my own heart, I would never be able to be right. And thank God I was right. But it was that moment. So I had, I don't know if it was imposter syndrome, but I, I really, my worst days were the no days. I'm, I'm, I'm going to call that as the woman who didn't really feel imposter syndrome and just okay. knew she was a boss and could be the boss from the very beginning. But I made myself the boss. I love to that. be the boss. I love. No, I think that's like no the best thing ever. Boston. Love <laughs> I that. I just took the fucking be the boss. Baton. I love that. I love that. So I want to talk for a few minutes now about the root causes of this because the more we understand root causes, the more we can help ourselves and help other women through it. And Deborah, I want to start with you here because I imagine one of the root causes is this notion of to be her, you need to see her. And when we see her acting like Shelley just described, we can then be her. You've been incredibly involved from your perch at J&J &J in this See Her initiative with the ANA and in basically better depiction of women in advertising and media, talk about that. Talk about how that actually connects to banishing imposter syndrome. Sure. Um, so first and foremost, it's about creating awareness of gender disparity, gender inequality, and really building the collective consciousness. And how we do that at J&J &J starts with unconscious bias training, because people aren't even aware that they have these biases, that they don't challenge the status quo, that they don't question the norm. So it starts with the awareness. Then what we've done with hashtag see her is embrace the measurement because as Shelley says, what gets measured is treasured, what gets measured matters, right? So we're embedding the measurement in the testing so we can really see the improvement. But the other big opportunity I see, and this is part of the UN 
alliance, unstereotyped and maybe to be rebranded as something else, I don't know, we'll see, mm -hmm. um, is really backing up the funnel to the people creating the content. And I was on a panel yesterday with Madeline Denona from the Gina Davis Institute, and when you talk about, you know, look at Hollywood, who's creating entertainment, who are the directors, who are the producers, who's doing the casting, right? You see how backwards the industry is, and frankly, how we've fallen backwards in terms of entertainment and content. So how do we sort of back up the funnel, change the representation of the people creating the content so there is content that portrays women in the right way, right? So it's an industry we have to change. It starts with the collective consciousness, then the commitment to do something. Measurement is a start, but we really need to change the industry systemically. And we, J&J, &J, are committed to do that, starting with advertising. I will tell you my personal ambition, though, is to take it to healthcare, because in healthcare, there's such gender disparities of who the treaters are and who's in the clinical trials and how the treatment algorithms get set. So starts with communications that shape culture, but it could be so much more. So that, that that's amazing. I want you to give, I interviewed Keith Weed yesterday, and he talked about this, too. I want you to give a representative example. Keith Weed is the CMO the of The CMO of Unilever and also very involved with Unstereotype. I want to I want you to give an example of an ad before you were doing this and an ad after. So so I'm going to be very transparent and say we're still earlier days, so I don't have the before and after, but I do have the representative example. So when I was first asked to be part of hashtag see her movement. I was told that our Vino positively radiant ad with Jennifer Aniston had among the highest gem scores in the industry and in the beauty industry. And, and why is that? Well, one, Jen is portrayed as a woman that takes time for herself, which is aspirational, right? She's not a slave to the family or a slave to someone else's needs. She's a woman that takes time for herself. Two, she's authentic. And when you talk to our creative director, the brief is always, let Jen be Jen. And then Jen also has vulnerabilities. You know, we let her trip over her microphone on, on camera and let that stay in the final edit, right? So portraying women in, a, in an authentic, aspirational way is really the starting point, and we're looking to scale that commitment. Let Jen be Jen. I Can love I just, that. I just yes. want to elaborate on one yeah, thing that Deborah please. was talking about. The hashtag See Her Movement, you know, is one year old under the ANA. Um, UN Women wants to make it global, which is why we're talking about the Unsteered Alliance. Um, and the GEM score, gender equality measure, the first time we actually create metrics around success. You will never in the past have heard anyone, especially like a Deborah J&J, talking about their ad and how it's portraying women. So it's making us all much more conscious of the work that we're doing. And you know, we always have measured in advertising things like likability, how likable is the ad, yeah. purchase interest, do you buy the product, persuasion, did it persuade you with the relevant message? We now can talk about equality. And when you are conscious of these conversations, you sit around a creative table like Deborah you know, with her team talking about the authenticity of Jen. And so it's a really important initiative. We've tested over 20,000 ads in the last year with gender equality, and money talks. If J&J &J says they want to now place their ads in programming that portray girls and women in authentic ways, guess what happens to content? Hello. They start creating content with a conscious mind towards equality, and those dollars get moved. So it is finally using, not just we're admiring the problems, we know it's an issue, we're creating next step change that is creating progress and more importantly, accountability for being better. So I just wanted to elaborate because it's such an important movement and we thank every one of the marketers for putting their money, their stake in the yeah. grounds and it's, it's shaking people's And, and I have to tell you, from Cannes, and it'll be the last thing I no, say no, before no. you do something else, from the panel we did at Cannes on Unstereotype, we brought our, un, our marketers to the girls' lounge. Thanks to you, if you remember, you recruited us from the IPG breakfast. Those women that were at yes, that event so yes. said <laughs> that it was the most inspiring event they were at in, in Cannes. Why? Because they felt like they could do something to change the industry. They left feeling empowered, so that was really big. It's amazing. And I...
Alicia, you're also involved, and I think you should talk about um, what you've seen from this, the progress you're seeing. Well, you know, the power of this is in the stories that we're telling. We're telling stories of women and their authenticity, their power, allowing women to step into their power. Women have power inherently that is not celebrated, the feminine model of leadership. And telling those stories in an authentic way, meaning all dimensions of it, right, is allowing women to step into that power and see it. If you can see it, you can be it. I think also then suggests that women do belong here. Not only are we going to identify what that power is, we will showcase it, we will celebrate it, and therefore it has value, which tackles directly, do women belong here? Yes, in fact, and this is why, and we can all see it. Nothing has a bigger impact on culture than advertising, so it's so important. But you're bringing these stories front and center, so when Deloitte Digital became a partner in the Girls' Lounge, everyone has a signature moment, and, and Alicia raised her hand, she says, I want to interview all these amazing you know, women in the corporate world. You know, We have power. And we have voice, and we can make a difference. And you feature them now in Wall Street Journal. You know, and one of the most important pillars in the Girls' Journal is visibility of each and every one of us that actually can activate change. So, you know, thank you for that. It's amazing. And I just want to say, I read the piece in the journal. Um, it's part of CMO today, and I thought it was amazing. And I we'll was do New York thrilled. Times, too, if you want. Yes. <laughs> I was thrilled. I was thrilled. Come, come get the New York Times involved as a brand, too, not just, not just as a journalism organization. So um, I want to go to another root cause, which is the fear of failure. So speaking of the Times, um, the, the author of the book Feminist Fight Club, Jessica Bennett, did this incredible story in the Times, I think in June, where she basically went up to Smith College and followed the curriculum that they've just developed. So Smith, as you all know, is a women's college, and they have just developed a curriculum for first years all about failure. And the idea is they had all these women coming in first year of college, and they were so brittle that the sense was they were so afraid um, of anything other than great achievement that they didn't have the capacity or the skills to deal with failure. So I want to ask, and I, I want to go to you on this, Dylan, because I consider you and Shelley to be sort of the ringleaders for all of us on you're the both topic. Tiny. Look you're, how little you're, we are. You're, you're so tiny. <laughs> you're tiny only only but in physical mighty. stature. I tiny I but I mighty. I sat back and, and I was like, my feet yeah. don't touch the ground. So I so. Anyway, they, sorry. They, they say fear of failure plagues women even more than men. What is it that we can do as executives, as bosses, to like quash that in the women coming up behind us? I mean, it's it's been so fun to listen to everyone because there is this just such a common theme of, you know, we say if she can see it, she can be it, you know, see her, all those kinds of things and storytelling. I mean, you know, our weapon is um, is storytelling. Uh, you know, we, but what we do at Makers, you know, we've profiled over 400 women now. And, you know, each and every one of them has a story of failure. I mean, you know, Oprah Winfrey was fired from her first talk show. Well, she showed them. You know, Ariana Huffington, she had 30 no's when she was trying to build a media company. And so then she went off. She's like, I'll just do it myself. Well, that worked, right? So we're trying to, you know, flood the marketplace with stories of women and failure, you know, for, from all walks of life, not just the Oprahs, but, you know, also the, the, the firefighters um, and, the, and the plumbers. And, but, but what we realized at one point in, in our journey early on was um, we can't just tell the stories um, of, you know, we can't just tell the stories of the famous people. There are women in all of our organizations whose stories need to be told. And actually, uh, many of you know Megan Smith. Um, and Megan was the chief technology officer of the US under Obama. She, came, she was at Google at the time, and she came to us and she said, you know, I'm really trying to raise the profile um, of women in engineering. And I said, well, why don't we do the makers at Google? And so she said, sure. And so we went in and we told their stories. And all of a sudden, people in the company started to see them. And they started talking candidly about their failures. And, and all of a sudden, this little movement started within Google. And then we said, well, why don't we scale that? Why don't we do the makers at the New York Times? Thank you, Meredith. Um, and we created a huge conference that we do every February. We bring all the makers at 
companies together and we share their stories, we network them, and then we send them back to their organizations, you know, with new empowerment. So that's, you know, we call it the Makers Act program and, and that's what we're really doing. But the, the point is get the stories out there. Julie, I want I want you to talk about this again. Two two dozen years at Microsoft company, lots and lots of men around you. Do you feel comfortable processing failure with other executives? Do the people on your team feel that way? Sure. I, the culture or the environment I try to create is one where it's OK to learn. And I call it learning. I don't call it failure. The fail fast thing, I hate that. It's about learning, learning fast, having a hypothesis, trying it, adjusting it, moving forward. Uh, and so creating that, you know, we're here to learn and we're a learning organization and we're going to learn from each other and everybody's going to get a safe space to bring what they do best into the organization. And then, you know, my job as an executive or as a leader of that is to create that environment for them. Then you, then it's not so bad because you're focusing on the goal and you're all in on the goal together. And it's not one person's failure, but the collective of the team. Yeah. Let me, let me ask you another question. How, how do you harness, um, men here, particularly if we know that this flicks women more than men, how do you get men involved? Well, you create, th men have a lot of the same fears. I mean, a lot of men, uh, the way that they, you know, the blustering or the things that we've come to know, that's also a lot of times motivated by their own imposter syndrome. Yep. And not being, feeling confident enough so it comes out in a completely different way. So just understanding that that's in the room, you can start to make it easier for them to show that vulnerability or to say what they think or to, um, that you're here to listen and learn and everybody's in it together and then you can lower that down. But having male advocates, people that know you, know how you think, that you trust, that you can go and talk to can really support you. I've had many situations in meetings where I mean, we've all had this where you have an, you're pretty sure it's a brilliant idea. Everyone ignores it for a few, <laughs> few minutes and then some other person says the idea right after that. <laughs> so, <laughs> has anyone had that happen? <gasps> okay. <laughs> it happens no matter how senior you get in whatever company you're in. Um, and so, but what I was able to create in my organization was the ability for people to feel comfortable saying, hey, didn't Julie just say that a minute ago? Let's go back and hear more about what she thought about that. And so we start, and that comes from men, and then next time they're gonna wait for me to finish my whole thought because if not, this guy over here is gonna make sure I get heard. So finding those kinds of, you know, reinforcing women helping each other, but also finding those male advocates that can help create the environment for everyone to speak. And celebrating them. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, we, yeah. start, we decided we started something called Makers Men. Right. Because we want men to feel really great about it w when they're doing all these incredible things for women. And, and um, you know, there's, there's no greater Makers Man than Tim Armstrong, the CEO of Oath, was AOL, now, now Oath. And, you know, when you start praising them, we've started this new thing called Ma the Maker's Man Pass at our conference. So every company gets to bring a man, and we're going to do programming around that. It's really important. Well, I think what Alicia was saying earlier about knew a man pass. focusing on the mission, mm -hmm. you know, and having the mission be the focus of the organization and the thing that you're trying to get done is really the breaks down the barriers, and you're just focusing on, you know, I always say run towards what you're scared of, like run towards the edge of that cliff because that's where all the new things can happen and that's where all the creativity is. So if you can focus on that, then the male femaleness kind of falls away when you're all working on the same problem together. Well, I, I think also very importantly, it's respect for humans. And yeah. you know, my biggest epiphany recently is how do you really fix a problem if you truly don't understand it? And it's that experience. Like I recently, you know, experienced in the girls' lounge actually a VR on domestic violence. We all read about domestic violence. We all hear about domestic violence. But, you know, we're so fortunate that we never experienced it. But if you did, you would get it on a whole other level. So I was in this VR experience. I was hiding from this guy coming after me. I found myself like looking for coverage and, and that's like an extreme example. Yeah. But even in the business world, you know, when we have men that are quote unquote, our bosses are mentoring us. Well, if, if they've never had a baby before, I mean, they don't know that A, your body is going through a whole different thing. And postpartum depression is real. 
you can read about it, you can hear about it, you can, you know, say you sympathize and empathize. It's it's not like three months that we're playing more golf. You know what I mean? It's it's real. Or if you've never been interrupted before, you kind of say, oh, God, come on, don't be such a baby. Like, how bad is it if someone, we all get interrupted. Unless you really got interrupted before, you don't understand what that feels like and you don't respond. Or if you, you know, found out you were paid 79 cents on the dollar, you know, for the same work. You don't really get it until you experience it. So I just want to say, yes, we need to you know, all work together. Gender equality is not a female issue. It's a social and economic issue. But we have to teach each other how to understand what we're going through so that we can grow together and make sure all of us succeed you know, in that way. I and, think it's and, so important. And one insight, I, well, so one, the male supporters are everything to lift women up and sponsor them because they have the seats at the table. But from my own experience, men want their daughters to be treated differently. Mm -hmm. So every male I've ever worked for wants the right mentor and role model for his daughter because his daughter is going to be some big, powerful executive in some other world. I so get asked to mentor daughters a lot. I do all the time. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that the like when it's piece. personal, exactly. Yeah. That's when it's daughter. personal, yeah. change happens. My daughter is going to live a different life. <laughs> totally. So, so Shelly, to your point, so then make it personal, which is right. basically what make you're it. Per We're actually working on a VR thing right now, which I'm so excited about for equality and discrimination, you know, intolerance. Because until you experience being interrupted, or whatever, you really don't get it. So we actually are working with people in VR to create one, mm -hmm. even though it doesn't sound at all like domestic violence in relative mm -hmm. perspective. But listen, we we got to do it so that we can stop talking about the wage gap. You know? There's there so many cool so things sick of this like that that you can do. <laughs> so we've been doing some experimentation with uh, having people wear headsets during, the, during their meetings, and then your voice, a female voice, gets modulated down a couple octaves, and it gets listened to better by men in the room. Oh, and is it ready? Is it available? Crazy. No, it's still all in, oh. you know, research. I think, I think Can we have it first? At the dinner table. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so, Meredith, yeah. will you do a good quick wrap because we have a surprise. Yes, yes, yes. So um, I will. So we won't, we won't do more questions. I want to say um, so many great things came out of this. And this is an unusual panel because we got a little more personal than we typically do. Dylan let us off so brilliantly with name her and banish her about that <laughs> imposter inside. Um, Julie reminded us, and I, I'm going to go back to the office and think this, nobody is thinking that hard about you. I love that. Um, Deborah, you said look for the inflictors, like there are people trying to make you feel this way, and then also look for the sponsors because there are plenty of people around to help you not or help you push through it. I love that. Alicia, I love this is a moment of such extreme uncertainty in everyone's business that we all should just run for the gray, and everyone is an imposter in the gray. What a big, big notion to that. Um, Shelly Zalas, no one gave me permission to be a badass. <laughs> I just was. Love that. Um, see her begins, I, th this was really big. See her, the whole hashtag see her movement begins with the notion that there's nothing that has more power to impact culture than advertising. That's a huge thought and we should carry that forward this week. We need to start celebrating the men um, who are, are such bold supporters. I went last night to Antonio Lucio's HP event, um, all about diversity. I was so moved and impressed by that and what he's done. And I love, Dylan, the notion of let's start giving out some man passes. There are plenty of men who are helping on this topic. And then we will end with Shelly Zalas. When it's personal, change happens. So we need to figure out how to make it personal. With that, I think there is a surprise act coming. We do. We have a surprise. There's always surprises. So a big, big thank you all to this incredible panel. And thank you all for being here. And, and to Meredith that brings it all home. And we need all your notes all the time. So Best moderator ever. Antonique Smith, who played Mimi in Rent. Uh, she played Faith Evans in the movie Notorious about Notorious B-I-G-E-E. -E. And she's Grammy nominated, but most importantly, she is a role model for hashtag 
see her, and she has come here to perform for you. So please welcome Antonique. Woo! There is women all over the country, in the world, really suffering in ways that people don't all know about. And, and in the movement, the, the climate movement and the environmental justice movement, the female quotient's a little lower than I'd like it to be. And, you know, we want to see her healthy. You know, the little girl who's in Baltimore who lives up the street from an incinerator and she has asthma. Or the teenage girl who's in Los Angeles who's getting nosebleeds and headaches because she lives 200 feet. Think about that. That's like the back of the room, really, from an oil drilling site. Or the woman in Flint who is having stillborn children because of the pollution in that water. Or the woman who lives in the complex in Chicago that's built on a landfill where actually hundreds of people have died in this complex just from that pollution. And, you know, we want to see her healthy. We want to see her live. And so that's something that is really, you know, one of my, my major passions. It's something that I feel is my purpose. One of the purposes of my gift is to help inspire people to change and inform. Sometimes we don't always know the issues. And so there's two songs that I'm going to start with. One is I'm going to sing it a cappella because it was written by the poet Marvin Gaye over 40 years ago. And uh, I, I, I sang it one time, and Leonardo DiCaprio said, were those the real words to the song? Because we've all heard the song a million times, but nobody knows that these are the words that he's been saying. And so that's that song is going to speak to the problems. And then the next song I'm going to do is going to speak to the solutions. So here we go. Oh, mercy, mercy me. All things ain't what they used to be, no. Where did all the blue skies go? Poison is the wind that blows from the north and south and east. Oh, mercy, mercy me. All things ain't what they used to be, no. Oil wasted on the ocean and upon our seas. Fish full of mercury. Oh, mercy, mercy me. Oh, things ain't what they used to be. Radiation underground and in the sky. Animals and birds who live nearby are dying. Oh, mercy, mercy me. Oh, things ain't what they used to be. What about this overcrowded land? How much more abuse from men can she stand? Thank you. So those are the problems. Thank you. So those are the problems, but the solution is, here comes the sun, little darling. Here comes the sun, and I say, it's all right. Little darling, it's been a long, cold, lonely winter. Little darling, it feels like years since it's been here. Sun, 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 
I feel the ice is slowly melting. Little darling, it seems like years since it's been clear. But here comes the sun, little darling. Here comes the sun, and I say, it's all right. Sun, 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 here it comes. Sun, sun, Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, and it's all right. <laughs> thank you so much. So that song is actually on my EP. My EP is called Love Is Everything, because love is everything. Honestly, the reason why we need See Her, the reason why we need the female quotient is because there's a lack of love, because there would be equality if there was more love in this world. So I'm trying to spread the love. <laughs> so this next song, my new single and you know we spend so much time focusing on what we don't have yet and what we're trying to get you know especially us ambitious women we trying to achieve so we we focused on that goal or we're focused on the past and who might have hurt us it broke our hearts and the song says the future is just a promise that may change with the weather the past is just a photo book all we really have is now. Do I drive you crazy with my one word answer? Test your patience with my stubborn silence. Do you really want to know what's on my mind? Well, here I go again, spoiling paradise. And I'm so caught up making sure you stay forever that I forgot to love the time we spend together. I just want to breathe in, stop second guessing, look at you smile and take it in. Try to relax and live in the moment. It's all that we've got to believe in. The future's just a promise that may change with the weather. The past is just a photo book, still I'm chasing forever. Why do I keep searching for something I've already found? When all we really have is now. Yeah, yeah. All we really have is now. Overcast with a chance of sunshine. Trying to make it last while I know you're still mine. And I'm scared to show this fragile feeling that we live on with all my frustrations and high expectations. Just take it as it comes. What I've got with you is as good as it gets. And I don't want to look back at mischances and regret. I just want to breathe in, stop second guessing, look at you smile and take it in. Try to relax and live in 
the moment it's all that we've got to believe in the future is just a promise that may change with the weather the past is just a photo book still i'm chasing forever why do i keep searching for something i've already found because all we really have is now yeah, yeah. and i don't for granted treasure the seeds that we planted you're all that i ever wanted baby yeah. i'm gonna stop bringing rain clouds appreciate all that i have now in the big picture all that counts is that i'm with you don't ever take it away i just want to breathe in Stop second guessing, look at you smile and take it in. Try to relax and live in the moment, it's all that we can believe in. The future is a promise, never mind the weather, cause through the storm and rain, we will be together. There's no point in searching for something I've already found, cause all we really have is now. Thank you. And this last song, thank you so much. This last song, we get to turn up on this last song. So this is a song I got nominated for the Grammy for. It's called Hold Up, Wait a Minute. And so we need the female quotient because of some of the stuff that's hold up, wait a minute going on in this world. We need to see her because of hold up, wait a minute. These are hold up, wait a minute moments. Whatever's bad, whatever ain't right. You know, it could be your relationship. It could be that gym score when that gym score ain't right. That's hold up, wait a minute. You know, the fact that a lot of people voted against Hillary Clinton because she was a woman is hold up, wait a minute. The fact that women aren't getting paid equal, hold up, wait a minute. It's all, we got a bunch of hold up, wait a minute moments. That's why we're in this room. We fighting these hold up, wait a minute moments. So this is our time to get a little aggressive, you know, to put our foot down and say, hold up, wait a minute. Consuming me since you wage and war in the hell with peace. Hold up, wait a minute. Oh, woo woo, wait a minute. Hold up, wait a minute. Woo 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 woo, wait a minute. See this disrespect, boy, ain't for me. All you do is take, honey. It ain't free. Hold up, wait a minute. Oh, woo -woo. Hold up, wait a minute. Hey, I deserve so much more than what you're giving to me. I don't know how I let my feelings make a fool out of me. But as I open my eyes, I see that you must be blind because somebody else like me won't be so easy to find. Oh, hold up, wait a minute. Hold up. Hey, I deserve 
so much more than what you're giving to me. I don't know how I let my feelings make a fool out of me. But as I open my eyes, see that you must be blind because somebody else like me won't be so easy to find. Oh, hold up, wait a minute. Hold up, wait a minute. Thank you, Female Quotient. Thank you. See her. I love y'all so much. We're going to get this. <laughs> <laughs>